afternoon, everyone. My name is Ruta Shaw Gordon, and I am the Vice President at Wagner College for Internationalization, Intercultural Affairs, and Campus Life. And I'm so excited since I've had three years as being in this program as the Administrative Director. I've gotten to meet many wonderful young African fellows and I'm so delighted to be here today to help moderate this Ignite Talk. If you guys were here at one of the Ignite Talks this morning, you were inspired because they were just wonderful. And so what we're hoping is that this afternoon, you will listen to these wonderful fellows that you yourselves have chosen to represent the institutions that you've been at. And they will be talking on various issues around equality, ethics, and opportunity. And then you will have the opportunity to engage in a discussion with them and hopefully start to think about what are some next steps after you leave the summit. So without further delay, help me to congratulate them for being picked and to begin the Ignite Talks. So first, we will hear from Abdul Rafio Lassisi, who is representing Appalachian State College University. <laughs> Let's have a quiz, ladies and gentlemen. If I say, what is the richest countries in the world, which one do you think of? No. Qatar. And if I say, no, 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 no. And if I say the seventh richest country in the world, do you think of the United States of America? Where am I heading to with this quiz, ladies and gentlemen? Mind you that though those countries are ranked the richest countries in the world, they also rank from the top richest to the last richest. Guess what? Inequality. But equality is my concern right here, ladies and gentlemen. Equality is a concept that is clearly stated in the Declaration of Independence of the United States of America in its preamble, first sentence, the I quote. We hold this truth to be self-evident that all men are created equal. And throughout history, throughout history up to now, America has been processing the meaning of equality with a whole lot of problems to solve as well, mm -hmm. such as poverty, unemployment, discrimination, racism, and what have you? Just to quote Bernardo Tieno. But as far as poverty is concerned, 14% of the overall population of the United States of America is poor, according to basic statistics in 2014. And over there, you can also see my country, Togo, for we are ranked the ninth poorest country in the world. And I hope that all this gives you a clear picture of what it is in equality. But you know what? This is not my concern. For my concern is not to teach you what it is in equality. For we all know what it is in equality. For we all know what it is in equality when we still have on the continent people who don't want to let girls go to school. And when they do go, they don't have equal access to job opportunity. For we all know what it is in equality when we see how people who deny to people living with disability equal access to job opportunity. For we all know what it is in equality when we see how people who kill their fellows for what? For race sake. For we all know what it is in equality when we eat a lot of food but have to waste all that when some don't even have a meal a day. 
but we all know what it is, inequality. While we still discriminate people living with HIV. This is not my concern to teach you all that. But my concern is how to equalize all this. And I know that some pessimistic will say, can this even be possible? Oh, yes. It is possible for we Mandela Washington fellows are the solution. We've come from Africa with a whole lot of problems, yes, but with a whole lot of solutions as well that are our solutions, our projects. For we've come here to learn many things that we are ready to go and implement on the continent. For I do believe that we've been here is never by chance, but by destiny. You are listening to me? Yes, great. But play your part. Play your part. And as far as I'm concerned, I am playing my part. And I've come here with a project that is to create a center for people living with disability, but not only people living with disability, but each and every person who wants to have access to equal access, job opportunity, education, public speaking art, leadership, arts, all that, that can let them be the leader that they want to be, the leaders that they see in us, the leaders that we are. I am that leader for change. Ladies and gentlemen, what about you? Abdul very much for those inspiring wow. words. And now we are going to hear from Borso Tal, who is representing Arizona State University. Okay. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. I am not seeing you right now because I left my glasses at Arizona, Univers at Arizona State University, but I'm feeling you right now because you are with me. Yes. Mm. I would like to share my part of. It's right here. Oh, it's right here. Yeah, I got it. Okay. I'm an African citizen from Senegal. And I'm going to share a personal journey with you. And through that journey, I hope, invite you to change the narrative of what we understand today of women's rights. This is what we know of Senegal. Who knows Yusundur? And who knows Aiken? <laughs> this is what I would like to begin with about my country. A little over 60 years ago, my grandmother from Mauritania settled in Senegal and decided to get married and have her family there. And she very quickly understood that wanting big changes for her life and for her children was not necessarily going to be absent of challenges. So she decided to start small, beginning with her daughter, my mother. And what she taught her, go back, what she taught her was that when you are a woman in a society that doesn't necessarily give you all the opportunities that will allow you to feel equal to men, you have to find your way. And in finding your way, you have to never lose sight of your goal. And in that goal, no matter how big it is, you have to start small. And these are women I would like to share with you because in West Africa, in a larger sense, we praise our women we praise our women ancestors. We praise what they do for us and what they left as a legacy. In the northern part of Senegal, there was this group of women who one day, because the king was absent, felt invaded by Mauritanian people and they knew they were gonna be slaves. They had to make a choice. That was in 1820. And their choice today would have been the hardest one as it was for them. 
they decided to kill themselves, all by burning themselves alive in the huts of the village. Because what happened before was that they all disguised as men to fight the enemy. But they cheered too fast. As soon as they won the war, they cheered too loud, and the men realized that they were actually women. And they came back more armed and more willing to kill them all and make them slaves. So they decided to kill themselves. That's the legacy that we live with today. And I'm not the only one in Senegal. We can also remember Ablapoku from Ghana and Cote d'Ivoire. I don't know if my friends from Cote d'Ivoire are here. That woman gave herself, sacrificed herself for her people. Those are the lessons we grew up with in Africa as young women. This is my family. And this is my strength. These are my two little sisters. We grew up in a very loving family. Very rich, not with money, but with what we were taught with. And everything seemed to be perfect because my mother and father gave us the best of education until the one on the left side, which is your right, Aisatu, was a victim of rape. I am not going to stay here and talk about what happened. What, what I would like to do is with the little example that I have, share with you what impact it could have if we only change the narrative. How did I change the narrative? By creating a club called Young Advocates for Human Rights. It wasn't easy because we had to face society. It wasn't easy because she is a girl. It wasn't easy because she was wrong before anybody could think of what the other man did. And here are the different activities that we do. We go around inland and in town to talk to people, to exchange with them, to tell them that this could happen only if no one talks about it. Here she is today, and this is the message that she's left me with, and this is the one I'm sharing with you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Borso. That was very good. And now we are going to have Hadiza Daret Kasimu representing the presidential precinct. Hello, everyone. My name is Hadiza Daret Kasimu. I'm from Nigeria, and today I would like to discuss with you the topic of discrimination against people with disabilities in Africa. Many people believe that if you have a disability, then you have no future. Parents often become very depressed with their children who have disabilities. They will not educate them the way they educate their other children. As a result of no education, they often become beggars on the street. And they are move from place to place. Even at a university level, they are told they can only study one area of topic. They can only study special education. People with disabilities are not given equal opportunities They do not get to make those choices when they take university classes. Even though they hold the same certificate, they are often not selected for the job. There's lots of violence that goes on in Nigeria. Fighting and killing of innocent people happens all the time. However, people with disabilities live in these villages can you imagine a person with a disability trying to find their way to safety with all that violence going on? The blind people cannot see how to run to safety. The deaf people cannot hear how near the violence is. Physically challenged folks face mobility issues and are unable to run for safety. As a result, people with disabilities are left behind. Now, 
I want to ask you, I would like to teach you all one important sign. Please, if you will, I would like you to stand from your seats right now. Please stand with me so I can teach you a sign. Thank you, thank you. The sign that I would like to teach to you is inclusion. Please, join me. Inclusion. Good. Do it again. Uh, inclusion. Thank you. Include us. Thank you. Thank you. You can be seated now. So now let's talk about solutions. Providing equal opportunity for education for people with disabilities providing free education for people with disabilities, allowing people with disabilities to work in any office that they apply if they are qualified for the position. Let's include people with disabilities in state and federal budgets and programs. The government should give a salary to help stop the begging that occurs in the streets. Religious, political, and community leaders need to educate the public about the disabled community and promote peace. Now, let me tell you the reason why I am so passionate about this topic. I was not born deaf. I was born hearing. And because of an illness, I became deaf. When that happened, I faced many, many challenges in my life. My parents believed I had no hope. I dropped out of sixth grade primary school, and for the next six years, I did not attend. It was only when a member of my family was working at Gallaudet University, he heard about me and brought me a forum so that I could go back to school. My father did not believe I had a future. However, my mother, she understood my culture and realized my potential, and she was able to pay for my school fees. And because of her, I had the opportunity to continue my education to the university level. People with disabilities have a future. Look at me. I am here, perfect example. Our governor of Nassau State is living proof that I can also be a successful person. He is deaf. Let's go back home. Please join me in this fight. Let's unite and fight this together for the rights of people with disabilities. President Obama, join me in this fight. African leaders, please, let's fight. Let's fight for the rights of people with disabilities. God bless America, God bless Obama, and God bless the African leaders. I love you. Thank you, Hadima. 
Thank you very much, Hadiza. Now we will hear from Desmond Lunga from the University of California, Berkeley. Go Bears! Thank you, thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, thank you very much. Um, like she's already said, uh, my name is Desmond Lunga. Um, I'm from Botswana. Is Botswana in the house? Botswana? Yes. And um, I also come from UC Berkeley, uh, the Golden School of uh, Public uh, Policy, which is the number one public policy school in the world. So it's such an honor. Uh, when, when I was chosen, uh, my uh, fellows said I should talk about the different issues that they represent. And I have five minutes. I can't talk about uh, climate change. I can't talk about uh, uh, transgender. I can't talk about gays and lesbians. I cannot talk about, there's a lot of things. Sanitation. But what I can talk about is the people that have the power to change those policies and that behavior, which, which are the men that sit in our parliament, the men that sit in our council, and of course the boys that run in our streets. And I believe for us to be able to change the world, we need to re-socialize the boy child. I'll take you on a journey, a simple journey that uh, shows you how a boy child is raised. I would buy my boy child a toy car, and he spends the whole day going boom, boom, doosh, doosh. And then I'll buy my daughter a doll. And sometimes it's a white doll. I'm not going to go there. A doll. And she'll spend the day playing with that doll and saying, hello, Nana, how are you? Do you want food? Can I cook for you? And then later on, we have a woman who talks more and a man who doesn't talk. And we say, why is that? Because we have socialized them differently. It's important for us to look at how we raise our boy children. In, 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 back at home, uh, there's a saying that says, Uli sole, uskala. If you are a boy, if you fall, your mother or your father will tell you you are a soldier. You're not supposed to cry. So you are taught not to cry. And you grow up and you face your mother dies, uh, your sister dies, your sister is raped, all these things, and you're still not allowed to cry. And you're supposed to be a man. Are you made out of iron? Are you not human? It's very important for us to understand that men are human and to allow our kids to cry and to be able to uh, engage in dialogue with our kids at an early age. It's important also for us, for me as a man, to be able to teach my daughter what a good man is and how a good man treats a woman by treating my wife. It's a good way for me to teach my son how a woman is supposed to be taught to be treated by the way I treat my wife now. And it's important for us to realize that as a collective, as society, we have the strength to change that. When a man has multi-concurrent partners, he's called a what? A player. And a woman has a multi-concurrent partners, she's called a what? I don't want to go there, but it's said. It shows you how society shuns negative and tries and uh, grooms a woman more and leaves the, the boy to go out, play without a shirt, go out, uh, come late, it's okay because you're a boy. You're not taught how to take care of your health. The boy child cannot go into the bathroom when the father is bathing. The girl child can go into the bathroom when the mother is, is bathing. What does that tell you? It shows that we're not doing enough in terms of how to socialize our kids. But how can we be able to do that? Men need to start being allowed to show emotion be allowed to cry. When she talked, I felt it, and I, I, I dropped a tear. So it's important for us to be able to express ourselves. It's important for you as a community to say, we need to take action. In Botswana, we have grown a movement of men that say we want to be part of the change. We want to be part of that generation that is going to change it. And I'm here today to say throughout Africa, let's join that movement. Let's be able to say we want to change the way we socialize our men, so that they can sit at tables and be able to understand the pressures, the rape that they, 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 they do, the different negativity behaviors that they do to women and how it affects women. 
So in conclusion, I will say, because of you, we can be able to change that. It's not about me, but it's about you. It's about you going back and living the lives and being able to engage through media, through the different platforms that you meet people, that you engage people, through your child, through you saying as a man, what am I doing to be able to change the next generation of men? So it's either you're going to be part of the solution or you are going to be the change that you want to see. So thank you very much for that. Desmond, thank you very much. And now we're going to hear from Portia Derry representing the University of Delaware. Hello, everybody. Hello, everybody. I am Portia Derry from Ghana, representing the University of Delaware. I am a storyteller passionate about African stories. However, today I shall not be talking about African stories. I shall be talking about an equally important topic called opportunity, the power of the internet. And I ask you, can you imagine a world without internet? Can you? Can you dare imagine a world without internet? And majority of you are Mandela Washington fellows. How would you have applied for this fellowship? <laughs> but don't worry, let me illustrate for you. You would have written a long application letter like this, folded it neatly in an envelope, and for posting. But just imagine for a minute, the postmaster had a quarrel with his wife. And on his way to post your letters, he drops it like this. Scary, right? You might not be sitting here now. I was once a caterpillar struggling to break free. And do you know why? When I was 10 years old, something drastic happened to me. I lost my father. My father was the breadwinner of the family. And as much as I was going through emotional trauma, something critical was facing me. That was poverty, real poverty. Suddenly, my mother could not make ends meet because she was a housewife. And I watched her daily struggle to save money just to keep me in school. But I did become a beautiful butterfly with a strong will to help others. And when my mother sent me to school, it was terrible. Every night I went to bed with fear and woke up with renewed fear. Fear of what will happen when I got out of school. Because I knew that with certainty I had no father or anybody to search for a job for me when I finished. And so every day, instead of focusing on my potential, my best friend became fear. Deep fear, a fear that allowed you not to do anything. In 2012, something happened. My uncle bought me a smartphone, my first smartphone. And then I fell in love with the internet. One day, as I was googling and, you know, just enjoying myself, I came across a conference opportunity that was to be held in Accra. And mind you, that was the first time I was moving out to go to Accra, the capital city. And then I got there. And I saw African young leaders with amazing African stories to tell. They had so much stories about how they were helping their communities, building schools, helping voiceless women. And I felt so ashamed. And I felt anger. Whew. I was like, I had wasted all my four years in school complaining. Meanwhile, I knew I had potential. Right there and at that moment, I told myself, no, I too must have African stories to tell people. I too must be unique. And I promised myself that in the next two years time, when I Google my name, Portia Derry, I should find amazing stories about what I was doing for my community. And guess what? Right there and then, I founded my organization, the African Youth Writers Organization which is giving children a platform to explore their potential. So that unlike me, they don't have to wait when they're 23, 24, 
to explore their potential. And now today, through the same internet, I use it to help people to make sure that all children have an inclusive environment. But this presentation is not just about me. It's about other stories like Vieta from Nigeria, who due to the careless, who due to the careless mystic of a doctor, guess what, lost her voice. But through the, imp in the internet gave her the power to empower people. And it's about Agnes sitting right in front of me, who despite having a hearing disability, is using the internet to help the voiceless. And another good example is from Bindu, who is an operational director of Girls Develop It, whom they are using the internet to help women to code. But you ask, why is the internet so important? And I'll tell you why. The internet does not discriminate. The internet doesn't care whether you are poor or rich. It gives you the same amount of information. The internet doesn't take bribe. If the internet did, you wouldn't be sitting here. <laughs> Above all, the internet levels the playing ground. The internet doesn't care whether you're the president of America or you are a hunter in the Sahara forest. I want to end here by telling you, how do you use the internet? Remember, you have power in your hand to change the world. Thank you. Portia. And now we have Shalati Tefo representing Virginia Tech. Um, I have cue cards to keep time because I can talk for days. <laughs> I grew up at a time in South Africa where the apartheid system had constitutionally come to an end. And so I spent many years of my childhood being told how I should appreciate all the privileges I received. But privilege is subjective. And I learned that at a very young age. We lost our home when I was 13 and moved to a community called Olivenhout Bosch, where my mother had established an early childhood development center called Dimponyana Zalabing, meaning little gifts of home, with the aim of removing children off the streets and providing them with educational programs. As there was an increase in cases of children's physical and sexual abuse, we later expanded our services by registering as a place of safety with the Department of Social Development in 2001. Memories of my teenage years consist of sharing my room, clothes, toiletries, and even friends with the kids we received. After graduating from college, I worked in advertising for seven years in hope that I would fulfill my own financial plan before following my real passion, which is community development. Instead, I made a decision to follow my calling without an income. I literally stepped out in faith and had to learn to be content with the reality that I could never back out because I held the fate of too many souls in my hands. 15 years later, we still do not qualify for government funding because 80% of our children are illegal immigrants, which our government does not acknowledge. We survived through income generating initiatives and partners which I fortunately made relations with while working in the corporate world. Our personal property continues to be community property, but the community also continues to grow with social ills, such as expanded usage of drugs amongst young mothers, xenophobic attacks, youth whose school dropout numbers are on a high rise, We've had our successes in the programs and initiatives addressed to, created to address the needs of our community, like a food gardening project to empower the women and help them generate income for themselves, a recycling project involving a swap shop process that allows locals to obtain essential goods in exchange of their recyclable items, and hope that it would alleviate poverty, provide environmental awareness while keeping the community clean. But I'll admit to certain failures, failures that inspired me to apply for this program in hope that I would find a solution. Like picking up a newborn baby, fresh out of birth with nothing but the mother's placenta, nursing the baby, and then losing her to child welfare because she would benefit them more as an added line item in their budget. 
or being unable to send another child to school because his deceased parents were illegal immigrants who left him with no documentation of any kind, being threatened with arrest for fighting to give a, form, to give a child a form of identity that would enable him to progress in life. Still, these failures don't define me. Seeing my girls, who have now gained confidence through our sanitary pad program, glow in the dignity that they have been finally afforded, grooming fatherless children while sharing common pain, because I too grew up without a father, and know all too well the damaging effects of rejection, using what was meant to break me to build me. These are all at the heart of who I am. I stand here with the utmost honor, knowing I'm representing them and what we have overcome together. And after spending six weeks with my fellows from all over the continent and learning about the odds that they too fight every day, after we all came together to grieve the loss of our dearest JP and stand here today filled with his memory and, lost and bound, forever bound by lasting influence, I am filled with gratefulness, inspiration, and motivation. But it doesn't end here. I hope to establish a mobile clinic for the illegal immigrants who make 45% of our population and are yet denied basic services. To find partnership opportunities to establish a community college for the 62% of our youth who are financially unable to further their education. To create a culture of volunteering for our beneficiaries as well, to demonstrate to them that they too have something to give despite their challenges. And to establish more Dimponyana Tsalapeng centers that will operate on the principles of serving people with utmost love, honesty, and humility, which is the definition of who my mother is. I know for certain that through the civic leadership program, I have come to see, understand, and cement my future and dedication as a leader, and for that, I have you all to thank. Thank you, Shalati. And now we have Maut Alair from representing Wagner College. Thank you, Wagnerians and all the fellows. Uh, I'm honored to stand before you at this uh, important moment. And uh, I would like to say just, uh, it is not lack of sight which makes you weak, but it's lack of vision. I just want to start with uh, my humble story. Uh, I'm from South Sudan. And um, I would like to start with just with my little story. I grew up in an environment where disability is seen as a curse and where people with disabilities are locked in houses for fear of their families from them being seen by the public. Because in our community, seeing a disabled person on the street is considered as a sign of uh, economic weakness of that particular family. And therefore, most of the families tend to keep their people with disabilities at home. And one of the things and one of the things that I learned in that situation is that when you keep me at home and give me food, I think I can feel what these people are feeling. I can feel that they are saying that when you, give me, when you feed me more, you make me fat. But when you teach me, you make me smart. And this is, what, this is the concept that we have to develop. I could have been, uh, people with disabilities are considered to be beggars, dependent, useless and helpless. And I think I could have been one of those people. Because as I leave, people tend to follow me and try to give me some money because of the widespread concept that exists in the community. No matter how dressing I am, like the way I'm dressing here, somebody can come and try to give me money because he will be thinking that I'm looking for help, although it is not the truth. I could have been in that condition, or I could have been who people think I am, if because I'm not a superman. But the fact of the matter is that I was raised by a superwoman. <laughs> when I was seen as punishment and curse, she saw me as blessing and gift from God. 
when I was seen as burdened and helpless, she believed in my potential and treated me as a resource. When I was seen as disabled, she saw me as her child. Applaud our mothers for all the good things that they do to us without seeking reward. I learned in my life that one thing, I learned in my life as a person who lived in this condition, not to do things that make me smile, but to do things that draw a smile in the faces of others. Yes. And for that purpose, we established South Sudan Association of the Visually Impaired, where my focus is on promoting education for people with disabilities. We try to advocate for access to inclusive and quality education to people with disabilities so that they can, so that they can contribute to the development of their communities. It is not because of their disability that they cannot contribute, but it is just because of lack of opportunity. Most of the times we tend to focus on the disability that exists, but from this time around, I would want to advocate that people should focus on, on the ability that enable us to overcome disability. Yeah. One of the things that I try to stress on, because I have been seeing that it is disabled people who are advocating for their own rights, but our voice will be stronger if someone without disability can advocate for those rights. Yeah. As I was on a trip a few days ago, I was hearing the GPS saying, turn, turn left after a mile, turn right after a mile. So that got me mesmerized because it is a car speaking and guiding a person. And the issue is that why do we neglect our fellow human if we can develop something that will be able to do those kind of things. I wouldn't be surprised as a person to see a robot that has been created without a spirit saying that, I love you, my girlfriend, and his girlfriend say, I love you too. <laughs> it is, of course, not our bodies or what we see which make us strong, but what we feel because all of us share the common aspects of humanity. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, from here I would like to say thank you very much. Thank you very much. Before we get to questioning, to thank all of our panelists one more time. <laughs> Truly inspiring. So now we have, this is the section where you all are engaged. So we have a few people who have um, mics. Okay. <laughs> and so if you have a question for any of the panelists or all of the panelists, raise your hand and the mics will come about. So we've got one hand right here and then we'll come to this side of the room. Okay. Please introduce yourself and what institution you're from and your country and then you can ask the question. Thank you so much. My name is Paula Tyre and I'm from Uganda. I've been attached to Duquesne University, the best institution in America. <laughs> um, my question goes to the gentleman who talked about socialization and the lady that talked about internet freedom. Um, about the socialization, I would like to know what we can do to help engage men in these issues because I realized that our African cultures do uh, raise men or boys in a way that, you know, like you say, they, do, they shouldn't cry. And again, they are raised as, you know, heads of families. And so it comes to a certain, you know, to, a, to it, it brings a problem where they cannot report sexual and gender-based violence issues when they face them. So I would like to know what would you want to do in that area? How will you convince the men that it is okay to actually go report that my wife butters me every night or that I was raped? 
And then to the lady that talked about um, internet freedom, I would love to know how would you advocate for internet freedom in situations that are really complex, especially during elections? I've seen that in some of our countries whereby social media has been shut down during elections like for over four days or even a week, and we cannot express our views as young you know, change agents. So what would you, in, what would you do in that case? Thank you. Thank you. Desmond and then Portia. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for, for that question. And I think it's, it's critical for us to be able to, do, to realize that there's different interventions for different uh, age groups. Uh, back at home in Botswana, what we do is that we have a program that is called Men Care that engages men in being able to be part of their pregnancy, of uh, 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 their, their partner, being able to bond with their child while they're still in the stomach, being able to be in the delivery room. And you touched on a critical issue that says culture. Because even back at home, it's not cultural. Men are not supposed to be in the delivery room. But now that's where the policy comes in, where we need to now be able to change policies around that, encourage men to be part of the delivery room and be there for their kids. Learn how to change nappies. Learn how to bath these kids. And research has shown that men that are actually hands-on in terms of uh, washing and bathing their kids are less likely to use violence on women and the children. So that shows that they get, are able to engage emotionally by being able to provide that care. Um, unfortunately, I, didn't have, I, don't, I don't want to talk a, a lot, but especially when we look at the issue of care, um, men think that care is about feelings. It's about something that you say to somebody, I care. But it's about providing that service. That's why a lot of men uh, end up wanting women to cook for them, wash for them, and the women say, I take care of that, my partner. And yet they don't give them, give that care back to be able to do the same thing for your partner. So I think it's about educating them around that. And then when we look at the boy child, it's about being able to talk the same way you raise a girl child in issues of sexuality. Be able to talk to the boy at an early age about sexuality. Be able to allow them to express themselves. Be able to say to, you, to him, when you have sex with a lot of girls, you are putting the chances of yourself being infected. And this needs to come from other men, not mothers. I know mothers have been doing a, a great job. But what happens is that this boy then goes to other boys and meets in, within the community. And they talk about something different. And I was going to ask all the men that are here that are married to lift up their hands. Is there men that are married here? Yes. You can lift up your hands. OK. How many of you, how many of you, keep, keep your hands up, please. How, how, how many of you? How many of you? OK, thank you. How many of you? have cheated on your partners. So this is a simple exercise. Thank you. Thank you. I'm trying to keep time. This is, this is a simple exercise that shows you, if I had to ask a question, the same question at a bar with the same men that I hear, most of them would have probably kept their hands up and even told me the details of how they did it. Because as men, we do not uh, emphasize positive behavior amongst ourselves. But in public, we want to you know, withdraw. So being able to take that stand as a man and say, we want to be able to in impact other men and start the conversation and, uh, and, and groom our kids at an early program. There's a lot of other programs that you can uh, look up, but that's what we do. Thank you, Dr. Yeah. Portia? <laughs> Portia, do you want to answer the other question? not afford to even have a shutdown for a minute. In Ghana, for instance, we've had talk about, you know, we have upcoming election and people are contemplating shutting the internet during the election time, which is very bad. One way I would think, I would, uh, you know, suggest is that let's put pressure on corporate organizations, mm -hmm. you know, Coca-Cola, huge organizations to make sure that internet is accessible to all Africans. African cannot afford to be without internet. And a good example is the World Economic Forum with, in collaboration with uh, global sh shippers who have this nice initiative called Internet for All. I strongly believe that internet is a human right issue. Everybody should have access to internet, whether you are on the farm, in schools, everywhere. In situations whereby internet is threatened, and I know there are some countries with that situation, the youth have to stand up. They have to demand for it as a right. Just as we have right to eat and associate, everybody should have right to, in, to use the internet. 
And we cannot afford to have the internet shut down even for a minute. I would say that young people around the world, especially African fellows, should come together. Let's see how best we can make internet afford affordable. Let's put pressure on rich corporate organizations, on international organizations to make sure that, you know, there are clear cut ways in which internet can be accessible. And put pressures on political parties to not temper with our access to internet, because internet is a platform where we all get opportunities, both the poor and rich. You can imagine if the poor have no access to internet, what will happen? The rich will continue to get all the opportunities, which frankly is not fair. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I said I would come over to this side, so we're gonna get a gentleman now, right here. Thank you very much. My name is Prosper Ahmed Amukwando. I'm from Ghana. And interestingly, I'm with the Energy Institute, but I'm here. I work with Ghana Energy Commission. I also work with the African Union to realize Africa's goal to increase its electricity access. My question goes to all the panelists. How do you think that the access to energy, especially clean energy, or the lack of it thereof, impacts the goals that you want to achieve? Thank you. Okay, so who wants to start? Okay. Um, okay. I'll try to answer the, the question. Mm -hmm. When we talk of lack of energy, then it, it means that we cannot have, at this level, access to you know, internet as well. And then when you don't have access to your internet, then you cannot, like that, have, let's say, access to your education, good education. And then people who are not educated like as such, like that, cannot then well impact their generation. And then you see that the, the quality of leaders that we want to have cannot be achieved in that sense. Then I would say personally that a lack of energy is very, um, I mean, it's a problem that we need to think of and solve to have as you know, a complementary of what we are doing here, good impact on every you know, uh, project that we have here. Okay, thank you. Anybody else? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, um, I'll speak out loud. As I was explaining to you earlier, the reason why I created the Young Advocates for Human Rights was because I too was hurting from my sister's situation. The real victim is not necessarily the one who went through the sexual abuse. As the older sister, it hurt me to see my sister hurting, but it uplifted me to see her strength to come to the family and ask for help. And when I created the club, I was far from understanding that we were going to address other issues. Environment and energy are also one of those. The Young Advocates for Human Rights go around in the country, and there are many African students that I have in the club who go back to their countries and discuss the issues that are raised. And among them, like I just stated, is the environmental issues that we have. And how does it impact? Well, they discuss it. They share the issues that they have in their different countries, they find the solutions between them, and they see what works best for their countries and for the continent. And just the fact that they are able to have the space to address those issues as young people help them understand that they have a role to play for the future generations. So they don't necessarily have to wait for the elders or for the authorities to raise those issues. What they do is that they talk about it, they have workshops, they discuss those issues and they find solutions that they share. And I believe that as young people, if they are given that opportunity, if they are given the space to discuss those <laughs> problems, whether it's environmental or any other issues that they have, everything is related to human rights. Thank you. And that's the core belief of it. Thank you. Yes. Thank you very much uh, for that question. One, one would think it's, 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 it's a bit 
not relevant, but it is actually, it's key. Because when you look at uh, uh, energy, you realize that because of energy, you get a lot of urban migration. And who moves to the cities? It's the men. And who remains at home? It's the women and, and in the villages. And this leaves them in, in opportunities to be raped. This leaves them in opportunities where they are able to have to cook using fire. So there's a lot of effects that it actually affects more women than us men. Even when, when, when the city and uh, electricity switches off and there's a game, the men will go and watch the, 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 the football game at a, at a bar and still continues his life. So it's critical for us to know that if for us to be able to secure and ensure that women are brought to a certain uh, level, we need to have energy. And we need to ensure purposely that this energy is also uh, 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 created in areas where Poor uh, communities cannot be able to, 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 to access that. Because a lot of us as men are not in homes. And those homes are being run by women. They do the cooking. They do the, the uh, uh, helping the kids to read the homework uh, uh, in the night. So it's critical for us to look at those in, in that uh, area. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, oh, sorry, sorry. Hadzima. question that you asked. Uh, my goal uh, on discrimination, I'm really looking on how to include people with disabilities. Inclusion. Uh, I want to tell you something. My father is not deaf. My mother is not blind. All the members in my family, there's no disabilities except for myself. We come, we come here and we come from people like you. We're the same as you, we're all the same, but yet we're discriminated, discriminated against. Uh, and anything today, people with disabilities are always left behind. You can see that. In the North Africa, many of them are on the streets begging. Children are not able to go to school. And I try my best. And I make sure. I want to see that all people with disabilities will have the right to go to school. And also, I want to try to continue with my advocacy. I would like to touch the lives of many, many people. Any person who has children with disability, please, I, I ask you, ed educate them. Believe that they have a future. We are all here to be the leaders of tomorrow. Can you imagine President Obama if he didn't set up YALI, and the American government, the cooperation with them, you must know, and it's important to understand, uh, the young African leadership is vital. Thank you very much. Okay, so we're going to go right over here. Thank you very much for the there, opportunity. Next. And congratulations to all of the fellows who were speaking. We were totally inspired. Personally, I was moved. Um, I come from the human rights sector, and I work for an organization called Gender Dynamics, which is based in Cape Town in South Africa. Um, and we were focusing on the transgender community specifically. And my question goes to Desmond first, and then I believe to the other women on the panel itself. Firstly, Desmond, as you're speaking about a culture of socialization, I speak specifically at this point in time to a, a level of that socialization that normalizes the violence towards LGBTI persons, that continues to normalize the rape of lesbian identifying women, of transgender women, of even gay men in our continent, such that even in the spaces that we're convening in right now, that violence itself is something that somehow as social justice activists, we somehow condone, we somehow overlook, we somehow are not able to address 
address and speak to, such that when you are speaking and many others are speaking around gender-based violence, I keep hearing this from a lens of men on woman. The gender aspect that is meant to correct the gender and sexual orientation of the LGBTI community, where is it in this particular discourse that you are speaking to? And then I also go to the women on the panel. When we're talking about empowerment of women, are we speaking in entirety in an inclusive lens where we're speaking to all the marginalized women, women who identify as lesbian, women who identify as transgender, women living with disability, women living with HIV. So in so far as your um, articulation of inclusion within an, an, a framework of women empowerment, where are the marginalized women in that particular instance? Thank you. Okay. So why don't we start here and then we'll go right down. Okay. Uh, this is a very important question. Um, I will just share with you one of the activities that I do with the youth back home. And uh, you will, and I hope you'll better understand where we're coming from. Among the activities, what we do is that uh, we have young, younger students from, let's say, ninth grade all the way up to 12th grade. For the younger ones, we have what we call the radio show. And in that activity, not only do they express themselves about human rights, but we also have that activity for them to listen. And what we do is that we have several stories and we give to several people the opportunity to read to them. But I tape it. And once I finish taping it, I will go back to class and share that taping with them. I will be honest here, in the group, that I have with me, I have a group of LGBTI, but they hide in Senegal because it is not legal for them to show up and have their own lifestyle and be accepted. But because I'm in human rights, I have to be able to accept them and have them be a part of those who address the human rights issues that we have. And when I'm, once, I, once I finish taping them, the students don't see them. What they do is only that they hear their voices. When I put the tapes on, they don't make any difference between the straight and the lesbian, the straight and the gay person. That is the core. I believe, honestly, that we don't have to make a difference between human beings. And that's the message that I give to my youth. Again, until we change the narrative, until we see differently from what we've seen so far, we are not going to make any further moves. We have to accept to give a change in the words that we use. We have to accept to bring a change, not because of everything that happened in the past, but because of what we want to see in the future. If we carry the same words from the past, it's not going to work. We have to change it. And about your question, the best way to change it is to just see the person as a person. See the person as a human being. We are all different. We are, have, we are all coming from different backgrounds. But if we have the same vision of change, we must not see the person's color. We must not see the person's sexual orientation. And again, with my youth, the core belief is that we don't see the differences. What we see is what brings us together. And in the group, we don't talk about LGBTI the way that the rest of the world talks about it. Just because we do not want to use the same words, we change our words to have a better impact in the future. Thank you. Ms. Hadiza, would you? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I was talking about the villages before. Uh, and I'd like to comment on that. That's true. Uh, the village people, they really do need protection and safety. I hope you agree with me on this topic. We all need to save the lives of the village people, especially people with disabilities. Because what happens in the villages, we have many innocent people living there. And they may be working on the farm. They're looking for the food. They don't have jobs. 
they don't have an education. They don't really have any socialization with the people outside. And like I mentioned, violence. If we say we want to educate ourselves, we want to educate our children, we want to see the future of tomorrow. We need to stop the violence. Why do we keep fighting? Why do we keep killing? I hope we can encourage peace. And we really need to come together and work together to achieve our goals. I would like to save the lives of everybody so that we can continue and educate. Thank you. Thank you. Desmond? Okay, thank you very much, uh, Tepo, for that question. And I think it's a question that I strongly believe that we really need to do a lot around. And that's why when I was, was talking, I talked about not having certain uh, 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 ways on how we bring up the girl child and certain ways how we bring the boy child, but being able to socialize them as children. I gave you an example of even the toys that they play with. Being able to allow a child to have a choice of toy that they want, the color of clothes that they put on, allowing them to treat them differently. Don't treat them differently. Treat them the same. Because we have a problem where now women are saying they are supposed to be responsible, they are supposed to take care of themselves, and boys don't, don't do this. So now being able to say we are all children, you need to learn the same thing. And then sexuality will then uh, be, be, be at, at, at uh, uh, they be able to choose mm -hmm. what they, they want to, whether they want to identify uh, with a pink dress or want to, to identify with a certain way. They have a choice, but the main issue is about socializing them as human beings, socializing them as equal beings. So it's not about male or female. We are advocating for saying the same effort that we're making in grooming that female, let's groom also. Uh, the, the, the male identity. That's what we can do. And I would like to share a personal story with you. When I started this fellowship, who oh, I we went to Delaware and I, I had this wonderful friend who was openly gay. That was my first contact with a gay person. And then I suddenly realized that there was nothing different about him. In fact, he had such a good heart and a fighting spirit. <laughs> and then I asked myself this question. So why the anger? Why the fear? I mean, because he's equally like anybody else. So I think it's about the stories, about how we tell our own stories. And that is why African stories are important. It's about how Africans are able to change the narrative and spread the story. If you want to be inclusive, whether disability issues or LGBTI issues, you have to own your story and tell it. And don't just push the idea on people. Let them feel it from a human perspective. Let them feel it like I have felt it personally. At least when I go back home to Ghana, I have a personal encounter, a good personal encounter that I can say, a gay person is this and that. So let us brand ourselves and tell the story in a unique way that will touch other people, although we do not accept it. The people will sit back and say, wow, I mean, this fellow can be different. Yeah. Thank you. So in our sanitary pad uh, program, as much as it's for the girls, we involve the boys as well. Because back home, our government, and I'm not trying to, you know, <laughs> disrespect them. They are more focused on coming up with, you know, bring, we'll, well, they have free condoms for boys, and we are trying to advocate to get free sanitary pads for girls. Um, and they're looking at going to the extent of buying Jurex because the kids are not identifying with the generic brand that exists. And for me, it was concerning, and I decided to take action about it, even with our kids at the center who the boys were very like, uncomfortable if the girls were on their periods. And I had to sit with them and, and ask them, what do you understand about periods? Like, explain to me. And the guys were like, we don't want to hear it. We don't want to talk about it. And I was like, OK, cool. 
and I started including them on this program. And we later went to the extent of bringing people who are considered gay and it's taboo in the communities to say, okay, you, are, uh, you own a business, come and speak to the kids. And when we saw how the kids would react, it was almost coming across as like, oh my gosh, really, you're gay? Like, why are you talking to me? What is going on? You know, because of the way in which you are raised. And we've received children because the community said, no, this person is gay. Um, he's um, ashamed to the family. We don't want him anymore. But the solution, which is working currently for us, is really involving these communities, involving the people, getting them to talk, have dialogues. Even if people leave pissed off, it doesn't matter. But if I can have one child change their mindset and respect a person because of who they are and not what the community or society perceives them to be, then I know that I've done my job. So those are the initiatives that we um, do back home. Um, and it works. It works. <laughs> okay. Thank so, yeah. you. So uh, we're going to go with a question up here, and then we're going to... So, sorry. Oh, sorry. Mo, did you want to say something? Oh, yeah. Okay, sorry. Yes, uh, I believe that it is uh, a battle of uh, knowledge and ignorance, which I believe that in the end, knowledge, of course, will win, and it is about us knowing each other. I know in Africa how people, how LGBTI people are treated, and um, I was lucky to have one friend here at Wagner whose name is Tiara. I don't see him as something different anymore, but I see him as a person. And one thing that we need to put into our mind is to be able to amplify the voices of each other. Because I think people are suffering differently, but the only thing that ignorance divides us and knowledge unites us. We need to have the knowledge and unite. I can see the youth, the youth, although they are majority, but they are minority in decision making. I can see the women, despite the, despite the, the, that they, the fact that they deliver us and raise us, they remain also. And we, we look like we tell them that what you have done was not enough. I can see the elderly who serve us who, and who serve our nation with their strength. And when they grow old, they are told that you don't deserve any service. I think it is about us, all of us uniting. It's about our unity. Thank you. Thank you. And so I want to speak with the women about femi uh, feminists. So there's a lot of talk about women over in their other country. Okay, so the issue is about the men. Often we speak about how the men uh, will take advantage of the women and we want to speak about bringing up the rights of women. However, we often find that there's nothing within the community that is actually showing how we can bring up the rights of the women. Between the women's movements, the f feminists, we should have more workshops and conferences. However, there's no accessibility. So we have these workshops, but they're inaccessible to those who might need uh, mobility or sign language, as well as braille. So I'm lost to know what can we do to create a more inclusive community for women's rights. If we're leaving out those that are disabled, we're not bringing in a community of others. Sisters are being left out. 
Okay, great. So I think that question is a lot about intersectionality of disabilities and women's rights. So who would like to start on that? So I totally like this one when he says that the best way to go around the issue is to the way we raise our children. How are we raising our boys and girls? As much as we are raising our girls very well, we should also raise our boys very well. So that at least when they go out into the world, they go out into their schools, the way they see the world will be different. And in rural communities, I work in a very rural communities where um, women often stay at home. And I think that workshops are important, but most, uh, uh, more important than the workshops and other forums is starting at the home. How, the, how is the uh, father portraying himself to his sons, his daughters? That is where the action should start from. And I told you what, when we have a good foundation in the home, these children are going to grow, you know, understanding all these women's rights issues. Yeah, thank you. I would like to answer this question as well. When we're talking of disability issue, we cannot put aside this question of gender. Mm -hmm. Because in my country, for instance, you see that women with disability are suffering a lot. And I just want to talk about, um, I mean, say hi to Fanai, who is a feminist, a strong activist in this domain. And then in my country, as I was saying, you see that women are suffering a lot. They are sometimes, you know, abused, sexually abused, and they, they, they are led like that. They have children that they have to take care of themselves alone. And this is a problem. You imagine women suffering from you know, this and women who are now with disability, how this can be a burden for them. Then to deal with this issue properly and efficiently, I think that we need to take that into account. And if you come to employment as well, you see that men are more employed. And then now when you come to people living with disability, it's difficult for them to be all mm -hmm. employed, but more difficult for women that are with disability. Then over there, we need to take that as well into account. We cannot, because we're talking of disability, just forget about this gender issue, because it's both men and women who are living with this disability issue. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. I would just like to repeat the question so that I can best understand it. Uh, to my understanding, what you're talking about is uh, gender issues and women's rights, particularly those with disability. Am I right? Is that correct? <coughs> Just a minute, buddy. Yeah, 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 I get that. Yes. Gender issues and women's rights, particularly those with a disability. Yes, and very specifically related to the tools that might be needed for the women within the homes to provide that within the foundation. How do we do that? Could you repeat that again? Basically wanting to know the resources, <coughs> what's out there mm -hmm. for women that are able to provide within the home to teach those children. Okay. All right. So what, what are those resources? Okay. Um, this question is very, very important because normally society starts with a family and that's where everything goes from. More and more today we are realizing that some families do not play that role of providing resources and that makes it more difficult for children to grow healthy and able to contribute in a very positive way in the development of their communities. To change that setting, what we try to do with the club is provide the space so that children can understand what it takes to do something when it comes to human rights. What I'm trying to do is that I'm trying to have the children 
without making differences between people, understand that human rights are human rights for all without trying to make differences and stop at those differences. What I'm trying to teach them is embrace the differences and work together in order to bring the change they want to see. In that, I have to reckon that in our communities, little is done for people with disability. We have to address the issue because we could be talking about human rights, but the resources are not necessarily there. One of the things that I particularly take away from this fellowship is the organization that is all around people with disability, whether it's on the bus, whether it's in classes, whether it's in restaurants, everything is done to allow people with disability to have access just like everybody else. That is not the case in Africa. That is not the case in our communities. Until we reach that level, because it takes finances, it takes major change. And again, like I said from the beginning, major change cannot happen at a snap of a finger because there are many obstacles. Major change happens with very small steps toward the change we want to see. Until we reach that level, until we reach the level where we will see equal access for all, the best thing to do is to teach the young people how to understand that they have to make the effort to accept the other, they have to make the effort to understand the other. Until we have the roads that will have spaces for people who do not see, when they see somebody with the disability, the, the, the um, fact of not seeing, how do you say that? I'm, I'm a French speaker. Blindness. Huh? Blindness, okay. Until they have that resource, when they see someone like that, they need to help. Not to help because that person is inferior, but to help because that person at that moment needs something to reach to another place. They have to be patient. Because sometimes you could be talking to someone and they may not have the same rhythm as you. So they have to be patient and accepting. Again, the core belief when you educate a child is to let them understand that they are all equal. And it's only in that mindset that they are going to grow with that belief and make change compared to what we have today. It's just a matter of narrative. And it's just a matter of narrative. That's what will bring the child to behave a certain way. Thank you. Maru, I'm going to have Maru answer also. And then we'll go to the next question. What does it mean? Mao and Hadiza will answer, and then we'll go to the next question. Well, uh, as far as uh, accessibility to women is concerned, uh, it starts by recognizing that providing the reasonable accommodation that meet the needs of individual is a matter of right rather than privilege. And uh, I believe that if we recognize it as a matter of right, things will begin to improve for the better. And that can come through awareness raising. Once the society is aware, then they, it will be easy for them to recognize it as a right. The second point is to empower the particular person with disability so that he or she will be able to use the resources that are available. For example, for a deaf woman at a particular house, she needs to be provided with the necessary screens especially for those things which require voice so that she will be able to see what is written on the screen. And for a blind person, he will require things, for example, that are using a screen touch to have a voice so that he will be able to hear exactly what is on the screen. And I think this is not particularly expensive because the profit is more important. And I'm sure that it will help a lot. And it will not cost, but it will help. Thank you. And Hadiza? No, I don't have it. Okay. All right. We're going we're gonna to go right here. Behind you. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Uh, my name is Basil Mabasa from South Africa. Uh, I was at uh, Appalachian State University. And in class, we had one, of, one conversation that actually made me to reflect on so many things. Uh, it was led by Fanai. Um, so I think we, we are busy saying we need to 
change the boardroom, we need to change the way in which women are treated, and we need to change the way people with disabilities are treated. But that seems not to be happening. And I've tried to get in and try to understand what is actually happening. Why are we not getting it right? And I, and then I discovered that the problem lies in the classroom. The textbooks that we're using in our classroom, mm. for instance, when kids are learning and they're given examples, a woman would be portrayed as selling tomatoes. And when we talk about engineers, we talk about John. Mm. And when we talk about a CEO, we're not talking about someone who's disabled. When kids are at preschool level, when we show pictures of policemen and, uh, or doctors, we seem to have pictures of them, of males and you know, when we talk about nurses, we seem to have pictures of females. Maybe that is where we all can actually get involved and say, you know what, we need to change the content in our textbook because this content can be able to actually enforce bias towards certain people who are different from us. You know, I would love to read a textbook that talks about a CEO being a blind person so that these kids from an early age can actually be able to learn. So for us to change society, we need to change the classroom, which is actually a microcosm of society itself. And for us to change, we need to change it there. So maybe all of us can go and influence on a policy level to say, we need to change the content of our curriculum so that it reflects all sectors of society. Thank you. Thank you. So we're gonna, we're gonna, that was the last question I was just told. I know that there's a lot more questions. And so remember that tomorrow there's a whole bunch of meetups and so that you can get involved in those meetups. And there is one that is particularly on disabilities in the congressional room from 11 to one. So I know a lot of the question, there's lots of conversation and I think that's really great but unfortunately we're not gonna be able to finish talking about it here. So we'll continue these conversations and that's what this is supposed to be doing. It's supposed to be igniting ideas and conversations for you to continue to have. But I will let each person say one last thing and then we will conclude the program. So we'll start with Mao this time and we'll work this way. Mao, any last words? All right, uh, for me I believe that um, I realizing my vision depend on the representative of youth who are presenting here as young African leaders. I would not be excited to be cheered up when I say nice words, but I will be more excited when I see my vision being put into action in different <coughs> countries. From Cairo to Cape Town, from Mogadishu to Dakar, I want to see that our, diver our differences is no longer a point of controversy, but rather a source of appreciation of our human creation. Thank you. Um, my advice is very short. Um, we don't need, guys, we don't need, for now, we don't need resources to action our goals. You know, we have assets right here. Um, we need to use our voices we need to use the, this fellowship you know, to try and make change. Rather let the funding upgrade your initiatives. Don't wait on funding to start anything. You know, I think I'm with the other fellows here living testimonies of people who took their visions without an income but had a big heart to execute them and it attracts, it attracts resources. So that is my advice. Um, yeah, and I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Say something on um, his comment. The issue is not really just about the content of the textbook, but it's who is writing the textbooks. It's men. So it is about making sure that women get into the decision, uh, decision level making. Because if men are writing the textbooks, it doesn't matter what happens. They will continue putting things that reflect that a man is all powerful. Of course, men are powerful, but women too are powerful. So my final comment would be that we have so much power in our hands. 
that sometimes we underestimate that power. And we must remember that as African leaders, we are not here to compete against each other. Never. We cannot afford to compete against each other. We are in the 21st century. We just cannot afford to bear grudges and you know, envy each other. This is the time for us to stand up and support each other. If I have resources that my friend does not have, I can borrow him the resources. I can go to Kenya, go to Botswana, and help my friend organize. If I have knowledge about something, I have. I have, we, we, I have, we all have the responsibility to make sure that African works. We should all be embarrassed and angry that in the 21st century, Africa is still nowhere, despite the fact that we have potential. It's not enough to keep saying that African has potential. What is potential going to get us? We need action, we need results. We need Africans to create their own WhatsApp, to create their own Amazons. We need an African who is on the move. We need an African who is doing something. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'll also touch on, on uh, my, my friend from South Africa, what he just said. It's, it's, it's the content that we give our kids at school. It's the music they listen to. It's the TV they watch. So for us to be able to effectively socialize the boys, it needs to be holistic. It starts within the family. It starts within the, the radio stations, the TVs that they're watching, because those are the things that eventually shape us as human beings. And then my conclusion is that um, for us to be able to win this war, we, we need to work together. Mm -hmm. We need to work together. It's not going to be easy. It's going to be very difficult. But it will take a generation of young people that say, I choose to make that change. I choose to be part of this change. I choose to sacrifice my comfort zone now for the sake of the younger generation that is going to come. So that's what I would say to you. Thank you very much. Uh, my final words and my advice for you all, and myself included. First of all, I really want to thank you all uh, for your cooperation. My advice let us make peace. Let's keep peace in all of our countries, first and foremost. If without peace, we cannot educate ourselves. If there's no peace, we can't educate our children either. And if there's no peace, we cannot move around and have our freedom. In northern Nigeria, the Boko, the Boko Haram, um, the school kids in Boko Haram, they're taking away, they're taking away our students and they're getting kidnapped from schools in Nigeria. And that's still happening today. And a lots of the students are still missing. And lots of the schools are closed down as well. Before anything, we have to make peace in our countries. And that way, we can educate ourselves and our children. Even now, the fighting continues, and people are running for safety. Where's the peace? Where's our work? That's most important. Let's all work together and promote peace and unity and work together. Let's all work together and unite. Thank you. My turn. Okay. As countries in Africa, we are a system within a bigger system as a continent. Realities are different from one area to another. What I tell my young people is that the, I'll just go with this proverb, this African proverb, and it says, we are honestly going to know the true version of the story when the lion will tell how it went during the hunting season. Mm -hmm. We're not there yet. The lion hasn't spoken yet. Because what we have is the version of the hunter. With that, 
I do not want my young people to go with stories that will only favor a woman or a man or a person with disability or an LGBTIQ. The goal is to have a story that will put everybody together. That is the purpose. And we have this very richness in Africa that we tend to ignore. Because the definition that we give of poverty makes us all believe that it's an economic reason. Poverty is the absence of solidarity. Back in the days, a family would not starve because one person would come with one liter of oil, another person would come with one kilo of rice, another one would come with spice, and together we will cook, and as a family we will eat. You're right, from the person who just spoke about not seeing any changes. Because we set big goals, and we will want to reach them very quickly. There are many factors in between that come against what we want to achieve. A lot of resistance is out there. That's why this fellowship is important. Because it takes those who have a clear vision of what they want to do in their communities and for the continent. The reason why for the continent is because we all have the same issue. And together we will all have the same solutions to bring change. What I invite you to do and I'm speaking in the name of all the youth that I left behind, is that in every country, if only we could start with a club called Young Advocates for Human Rights. Start small, with big dreams. I already started with this fellowship. I talked to Hussein, I don't know if, if he's around, from Arizona State University. He's from Somalia. A lot of trouble in his country when it comes to human rights. And yet, he understands that through human rights, we can reach quality education. Through human rights, we can have positive impact in the lives of people. I have already begun collecting programs that I could share with him after this fellowship. I'm talking to Andre, I don't know if he's around, from Madagascar. Andre is an English teacher. Why not include human rights in his class? So that through literature, the youth can also understand. Because most of the books that we read are also about equality and inequality. Most of the books that we read, instead of talking about what is wrong with them, let us discuss how we can change what we read individually and as a group. Namibia is a small country. I don't know if anybody is here from Namibia. Yeah. In Namibia, they have something beautiful that needs to be raised and told about. In Namibia, at all levels of decision making, if one person is a man, the other one is a woman. Am I right or wrong? That's right. So the idea is to see what is positive in the community, what is beautiful in the community, and raise that. Growth comes only, and I strongly believe in this, and it changed my life. Growth comes only if we love and praise the positive and not feed on the negative. Thank you. The negative is always going to be here. But if we feed on the positive, change is going to happen. Okay. Thank you. And Abdul? Well, I want to say that we are here with, apparently, um, topics that are different. But when you pay attention, you see that all are linked. We're talking of disability, yes, but over there you can also have gender equality. Mm -hmm. And they, there you can also talk of LGBTI, and then you can also talk about education, and you can talk about energy, and everything is together over there. Mm -hmm. But just that we cannot embrace all of this while we just you know, focus on some points. But here, I want to call upon you to come here and just join us here and help us fight for what we are fighting for, and then have what we want as Africa united, and Africa stronger forever. And now to come back to this issue of disability, I want to say that, and I join the point of view of my fellow over there who says that it's only 
people living with disability who are fighting for you know, their rights and that he wants each and every one to come and join us. And then this will be you know, great solution and have more impact. And I want you to know that we're not just born disabled, we can become disabled. And if you think that today you are okay and that this is not your issue, then let me tell you that you are extremely wrong and that you are concerned. And then let's join our forces together and have this strong Africa. Because we are leaders, and remember, we are not here by chance, but by destiny. Africa needs us. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So join me again in thanking all of our incredible panelists. <laughs>